your generous support of the ministries here at Hillcrest SDA Church. To give, visit our website and hit the donate tab or visit Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign the Hill Nashville. Thank you for your support. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Welcome to another Sabbath here at Hillcrest. We are so happy that you decided to join us for our virtual worship service. We have some thank yous and announcements for you for today. To our Hillcrest family, there will never be enough words to express our love and gratitude to you for carrying us through this difficult time. As the Footprints in the Sand poem reads, during this time, we have looked down and seen only one set of footprints. We know that God and our Hillcrest family were carrying us. Thank you to everyone that made the service a beautiful celebration of baby Vinay's seven weeks of life on this earth. And thank you for the hot and delicious food. The beautiful memory box from Hillcrest was very thoughtful. Thank you, Family Life, for the basket of household items. Finally, to Hillcrest and the Women's Ministry, thank you for all of the donations. We were able to take care of everything that needed to be taken care of, and that means more to us than you will ever know. It's priceless. Hillcrest, we now have a void in our lives that will always be there, but know that it will be bearable because of you. We love you. Juanita Anderson, Jean Anderson, Janae Anderson, Marcus Prescott, and Marvell Prescott. Sister Irma Lee says, to my Hillcrest family, thank you for your beautiful arrangement and for your thoughts and prayers during my brief hospital stay. It was truly appreciated. George Claybrook says, thank you so much for your support, prayers, texts, and phone calls. I am at home comfortably healing from my broken hip. Again, that's from George Claybrooks. To our incredible Hillcrest family, we thank you so much for your kindness and thoughtfulness through the calls, text, concerns, and prayers received during our recent loss. Words cannot express how much we appreciate you all. With much love and gratitude, Lisa and Michael Jacobs. Youth of Hillcrest, parents of the youth of Hillcrest, guess what? Hillcrest is busy with the youth. They've been doing monster truck rallies. They've been doing outreach. They've been doing skating. And we want you and your kids to participate. So guess what? All the information that you need is on the Youth of Hillcrest Instagram. And if you have any children that you want to participate or who want to participate, you can contact the number below. We can't wait to see you doing this good work with us. And Congratulations. Congratulations to the Staple family for the birth of Mason Ethan Staple. We are so happy and we are celebrating with you because all good and perfect gifts come from above. Thank God for this gift of life. We are celebrating with you, Staple family. Now, as we move forward in our service, please enjoy. Happy Sabbath, Hillcrest. Hallelujah. What a privilege it is to worship God this morning. Hallelujah. I want you to type in the comments. Type and say, Happy Sabbath. Hallelujah. It's a privilege to be here. Bless your name. Does anybody believe that God is mighty? Hallelujah. Come on and worship God with us this morning. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Do y'all believe it? Lord, you're mighty. 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 Come on, lift your voice. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord, Lord, you're mighty. 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 
Help me sing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You said your glory above the heavens and the earth. Come on, Duena. Say, when I think. When I think of all you made, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Thank you, Jesus. No praise. No praise is high enough to express how great you are. Say, oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Say, you set your glory. You set your glory above the heavens and the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Say, when I think, when I think of all yes, the God. Jesus. Angels, Angels would bow. bow Hallelujah. A mighty God. Mighty God we serve. Come on, lift your voice and say, say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord, Come on, I want you to lift that up in your living room. Lord, you're mighty. All in your den, make it your sanctuary. Lord, and say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, Hallelujah. You're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, Come on, lift it up. Mighty. Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're Come on, mighty. do you believe it this morning? Lord, Hallelujah. You're He's so mighty. Lord, Bless your name. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're Come mighty. on, say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Hallelujah, he's mighty. Lord, you're mighty. He's great God. He's a mighty Lord, God. He's mighty. an awesome God. Hallelujah. Lord, you're mighty. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Now, come on, if you believe.
believe he's mighty, come on, give God some praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Happy Sabbath, Hillcrest. And those of you that are worshiping with us from wherever, you're part of Hillcrest now, that you're tuning in wherever you are. Psalms 121 says, I lift my eyes unto the mountains. Wherefore does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, before we ask you for anything, we want to thank you for everything that you've done for us. Those blessings seen and unseen, those things that we know nothing about, Lord. Lord, we're just so grateful to be here on your Sabbath day. We're so grateful that it is your day and we have this opportunity to draw closer to you, to get to know more about you, to place our hearts at your feet, Lord. So Lord, we're just thankful for the pastor and what he's gonna bring us today, what you filled him with to give to feed us. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the members. Your, your sheep are here, Lord, right now. And in the last few weeks or month or so, all we've been talking about is elephants and donkeys. But let us not forget about the lamb. So Lord, we just know that your spirit will be with us wherever we are. There are so many of us who have issues with mental depression going through this time. Lord, be with us. Be with those and touch those and let them know that they're not alone. Let them know that you will not leave them or forsake them. Leave them not lonely, Lord. You are with them wherever they go, wherever they are. Help their mental, help their minds, help their spirits, Lord. Lord, there are so many that need physical healing, that are having surgeries, have had surgeries, will have surgeries. Lord, be with them, heal them, be with the doctors and everyone that comes in contact with them. Test them in a way that they won't make mistakes or do things that will worsen the things. Lord, we know that every trial you have already weighed and measured our capabilities and you already know forgive our lack of faith in your belief in us so Lord we just ask that you be with those that are grieving Lord I don't have words to comfort anybody sometimes I can't even say what is needed to be said or think of what needed but I'm so grateful that we worship a God that can give peace beyond understanding comfort and Lord, some mysteries we just don't, we will not know on this earth and help us not to put our trust in things on this earth and strive to be with you in heaven, Lord. Let us not worry about things, but let us just be of your mind and your will. Lord, we ask that you bless those that have, are recuperating right now. There's many that are in the hospital, getting out of the hospital. There's many that have procedures. There's many that are grieving from past loss and recent loss. Lord, just comfort them as only you can. And we're so grateful that you've already won the battle. We thank you, Lord, for being undefeated, undisputed, undeniable, unchanging, Lord, and we are unashamed to call you our God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Hillcrest family. I just want to take just a brief moment here just to wish a happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans who have so faithfully served our country. Um, we pray that God's blessings upon you. We want you to know that we appreciate your service. Also want to take a moment just to encourage us to continue to keep our uh, members who have experienced some illness or injury. Um, Brother Clay Brooks, who is home now recovering. Um, Lynette, uh, who is uh, the the daughter of Wanda Coleman, uh, she's home recovering as well. And so we just praise God for all of the wonderful ways he's blessing our church family and just all of us and those who are dealing with difficult times during uh, these uncertain times. And so I uh, just want to extend that to you and I just want to invite you to bow your heads with me wherever you are as we prepare to open the word of God. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for your word to us. Lord, we thank you for this moment in time, this where we can turn our hearts and minds to you. Lord, I pray that you will transform this ordinary moment into something that is supernatural, that will forever change our lives and bring us closer to you. 
This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple years ago, I came across some research that reported that 88% of uh, Americans own a Bible. In fact, they say that the average number of Bibles in a home in America is actually 4.7. So almost in every home in America, there's almost five Bibles, an average of five Bibles in each home. Interestingly, though, the survey revealed that of those people who own Bibles, only 37% say that they actually read it once or more per week. Not a very high, high number. The survey also revealed that uh, among Gen Xers and boomers who are adults said 26% of them said that they never read the Bible. They've never read it. And then that number climbs a little bit higher even among the millennials who say they say 39% say that they never read the Bible. It's interesting, uh, these stats, particularly when you compare them to some statistics about the amount of time that people spend watching television. They say that the average person spends about four and a half hours a day watching television. They say in 2018, social media is actually now beginning to compete with television. They say in 2018 uh, that people were on social media for 142 minutes. Then in 2018, that number went up to two and a half hours, I mean in 2019, and then in 2020, this year alone, they're saying that people, adults, are spending an average of three hours a day on social media. These statistics I want to suggest to you today uh, reveals a new attitude towards the Word of God, a, a declining interest in our culture for spiritual things, particularly an appetite for the Word of God. And I want to suggest to you today, I want to ask the question, what would happen if we decided to change the channel, to turn off the television, or to change the channel from spending time on social media and spending more of that time in the Word of Christ? I wonder would that have a deep and profound impact on our own lives and our families? And so today I want to begin a new sermon series entitled called, entitled, Change, Changing the Channel. Are you willing to change the channel? And we want to talk about today in this sermon, how do you change the channel? What is needed? And I want to suggest to you today that the way that we change the channel is by digging into the word of Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you today uh, to turn with me in your Bibles to the letter of 2 Timothy that is in the New Testament there. If you could pass the Gospels, if you can make your way to 2 Timothy, I want to share why the Word of God is needed now more than ever in our world and in the time in which we are living in. I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version of the Bible, starting in verse 1, and I will read to verse 5. Here's what the Word of God says. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. And your afflictions do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul writes these words to Timothy, his young protege and son in the gospel ministry. He writes these words so that he can impress upon him just how important and central the word of God is for congregational life. He impresses, him, he impresses upon him the, 
the weight of his responsibility by reminding him that, that, that he is ministering in the context of eternity. In other words, the members in his congregations, when they hear the gospel preached, they are in that moment, they are making a decision that will have eternal implications. As a result, pretty much, of how they respond and how they hear the gospel when it's preached. When they hear the word of God, he wants them to know that it is of eternal proportions. Now, we often think that judgment is something that takes place at the end of time. But here we see in this passage, and we'll see even more clearly today, that judgment is something taking place every time the word of God is preached. In fact, Revelation 14, 6 says that we are living in the hour of God's judgment hour. We're living in the judgment hour of history. And how we respond to the gospel, even in this moment, while we are proclaiming the gospel in this moment, we are making decisions about where we will spend eternity. Timothy, Timothy's ministry is designed to prepare people to stand before God and their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who the Bible says, who Paul says, will judge both the living and the dead at his appearing when he returns. And not only that, when he comes, he will judge them, but he will also usher in the return of his eternal kingdom. This is why the ministry of the word is central to congregational life and why it must be central if Christ is to be truly revealed and for the people of God to be prepared for Jesus's return when he comes back. It is a solemn responsibility and a sacred charge carried out before the eyes of an all-seeing God who alone will hold Timothy accountable. But it is also an urgent need because people on earth are in a critical condition and time is running out. We're living in what Paul calls perilous times, literally difficult times, a time that reduces strength and diminishes our faith. So I want to read that in chapter three, verse one of Second Timothy, just to give us a little bit of a context of why he says what he says in verse 4. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Perilous times, he says. And when we think of perilous times, we often think about perilous time being what we call the time of trouble. When, when food will be scarce, when we will not be able to buy or sell or worship God freely on the day that he has designated that we should worship him. We think of perilous times as a time of civil unrest and, and calamity in our world. But here Paul expands the definition of what it means to be living in perilous time. He shows in this passage what will characterize the last days. And I want to suggest to you that what he shares here with us today, it is not something that is often preached or considered in Christian communities. And he says, he talks about, and I want to share it with you, he talks about what will define the condition of the hearts of believers and unbelievers at the end of time. He describes perilous times this way. I want to read it again. But he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And here's why, how he describes it. For men will be lovers of themselves. In other words, he's saying, we will know that we are in the last days because it will be a time of rampant self Love. This is what he calls perilous times. To truly understand the implications, 
we have to look at the following verses, the verses that come after that, or a part of what is called the vice list. It is a list comprised of of wicked and immoral behaviors. And here Paul is describing all of the wicked and the immoral behaviors that will take place at the end of time. But the chief characteristic of the vice list is the first thing that is on the list. The first thing that is named governs the entire list. Everything else that comes after that is an expansion of the number one thing that is shared, the first thing that is shared. If you remember, before he starts off, he says, for men will be lovers of themselves. That's the first thing. And everything that he says after that is an expansion of what it means to be a lover of yourself. Here we see that when self-love, when we love ourselves, we come first. Our desires take center stage. Our opinion alone matters. The only person that we care about is ourselves. We only make decisions based on what's best for us. But I don't want us to miss how else this is manifested. Notice what he says, and I want to read in verse chapter, starting in verse 2 to verse 5. He says, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then he says this, and from such people turn away. And here he is showing that this is what self-love, this is how it manifests itself in pride, in unforgiveness, in valuing pleasures over loving God. And he says that this will not just characterize, hear me now, not just people who don't know God, But here he shows us that this will be a characteristic feature even among the people of God, even in the church. Because this letter is written, he's addressing a pastor of a Christian congregation. He says he's talking to believers in the church. He says that they will have a power, they will have a form of godliness, but denying its power. Here he's showing that believers will profess to be followers of God. They will seem like they're followers of God, but it will only be a form. They will only really be pretending. Here he shows us that the focus of self-love is deceptive because it deceives us into thinking We are in a right relationship with God when we really aren't. The reason this is, is because we become the standard of spirituality and not the word of God. The reason why lovers of them, being lovers of ourselves is so dangerous because we become the standard of what is right and what is good and not Christ's word. And because of this, We are unable to distinguish the difference from our perspective than from God's perspective, even as it's revealed in the Word of God. I heard a story of a pastor who had to preach to his congregation one day, and he decided that he was not going to write a sermon, but instead he had spent some time memorizing the entire book of Galatians. And so that morning, instead of preaching a sermon that he wrote, he stood up and began reciting the book of Galatians to the congregation. That was his sermon that day. 
but he could never could have anticipated how the congregation responded. As he began sharing and, and repeating what was shared in the book of Galatians, the people started getting uncomfortable. Their faces began looking puzzled. They started looking confused. Some were looking even hostile to what he was saying. Later, when he finished the sermon that day and one member came to him and said, he said, what you were saying, I actually thought that you were lying, that you were teaching heresy. And the pastor had to show him that everything he said that day was actually found in Scripture. But they had gotten so far away from the Word of God that even when the Word of God was being recited to them, they did not recognize it. As a matter of fact, they were offended. They thought it was a lie. This could not be what God is saying to his people. And I want to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters, that that is what happens when we become the standard, when we have a form of godliness. We are not able to distinguish between our opinion and perspective than the difference between God's truth as revealed in his word. And the truth is, we are so into our own righteousness, our own self-improvement, that we tend to focus on things that cause us to make us feel holy. Things that cause us to look holy to other people. We focus on traditions that make us feel closer to God, not realizing that none of those things, that there is no righteousness, that there's no virtue, that there's no power in them. There's only power in Jesus Christ. But when this is our focus, we lose eternal perspective. We're not able to distinguish the word of Christ, even when it's preached to us directly to our hearts. When we are focused on even a religious righteousness in improving ourselves before God, it is only a form and it causes us to be unaware of our true condition. And you see, because we have become so focused on ourselves, we're so inwardly focused that and so focused on our perspectives and our truth and our story and our experience and our opinions that we're no longer able to distinguish between the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of this world. We have mistaken the wisdom of the world to be the same as the wisdom of God. Even worse, some of us, we've even tried to blend the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God and baptize it and sanctify it as if it is gospel truth. And the way that we know this, sometimes we do it inadvertently. We're not even trying to do that. But there's some things that we have, that we have heard and said ourselves for a long time, myself included, that we actually think that they are the actual words of Scripture. You know, you know, we have these sayings like cleanliness is next to godliness or God helps those who helps themselves or hate the sin and love the sinner. And we say it so much, these have become such important maxims that if I told you to find the scripture where it says, hate the sin and love the sinner, you would start looking in your Bible. But none of those maxims, although they have truth to them, none of them are scripture. Not only, Paul says, Will there be an increasingly unawareness of the truth that is in the teachings of Christ's word? But Paul says there will come a time when the teachings of Scripture will no longer be revered. They will no longer be considered the rule of life for faith and, and practice. He's letting us know that there will come a time 
Not only will people not know the difference with the word of God, but there will come a time when they won't even want to hear it, what it says. Notice what he says. We go back to chapter 4, verse 3. For he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And here he says that there will come a time when the people of God, not unbelievers in the world, but the people of God, where they will not endure sound teaching. And literally the word there for endure means that they will not put up with the teachings of the gospel. They will not put up with any teaching that corrects their views and their opinions and challenges their perspectives. They will not put up with anything that challenges what they value. They will not put up with any teaching from the word of God that challenges their view of what truth is. They will not put up with anything that tells them that their lifestyle and their decision makings and their attitudes is incongruent with the teachings of God and outside of his will. He says there will come a time when they will not endure. They will not put up with it. There will come a time, he says, when we will see, we will not see scripture as supremely beneficial for our lives. That's what he means by sound doctrine. When he talks about doctrine, he's simply talking about teachings. He's not just talking about the state of the dead or, or, or sal- the state of sal- what salvation means. He's not, but he's talking about all of the teachings of Scripture. He's saying there's going to come a time when people will not put up with the healthy teaching, with a uh, teaching that is beneficial, that brings life to the very atmosphere of our soul. He says they will not endure it. They will not want to hear it. When Scripture is seen as the ideal, as only an ideal to live by, you know, a pie in the sky. Oh, yeah, God put that in the Word, but He doesn't really expect us to live that way. When Scripture is only seen as this Uh, reality that cannot be attained and just something that's out there, then it reveals that we no longer have an appetite for the word of Christ. But not only that, when we see scripture as not being practical enough, if we see Scripture as something that needs to be supplemented by our experience or by, by something else, it is a sign that the Word of Christ is no longer central to our lives and our communities and our congregations. It means that we no longer see the benefit that the Word does, the Word provides. When our innovations, planning, creativity, wisdom, and skill organizationally is seen as what is most needed for growth of Christian congregations. When that is emphasized more than Scripture, when Scripture becomes secondary to that emphasis, it is a sign that Christ is not at the center of the community, that we no longer see the word of God as being, as having power to right all of the wrongs in a congregation and in our hearts and in our denomination. Now, there's nothing wrong with creativity and innovation, but it must be informed by the word of Christ. We think that we already have the word, and so we need to emphasize these other things. But when we make that deadly assumption We actually make Christ's word secondary. He says, because of this, notice what he says, this generation will not want to be corrected. Hmm? Because we don't want to hear the pure teaching of the word of God. This generation, this age, the end of time, he says, they will not want to be corrected. We will not want to be instructed in any way by Christ's words. 
but would rather live according to our own desires. Hmm. That's what he says will happen. And then notice what he says, how deadly that is. Notice what he says in verse 4. He says, and get, hear this now, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. When we don't value the teachings of Christ's word, when we don't want to hear the truth, he says, that we will plug our ears and that we will turn aside to fables. Myths, stories, fiction. In other words, he's saying here that we would rather take our lessons from something other than the Word. When the lessons from movies and, and, and the entertainment world guides and shapes our lives more than Christ's Word, then we have turned away from the truth and we have put our faith in a story, a fictional story. Some people who make their decisions about life based on what they see on a screen or what their favorite artist sings about. They're, they're wise sayings. And here Paul is saying that it's all, it's a myth. When we disregard the word of Christ, when we turn our hearts, when we would rather our desires to lead us, then we turn to fables. And what does it mean when we turn to fables? That means we have lost our view of Jesus Christ, that our soul is in danger. He says that this will be so severe that believers will even gather to themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. That's what he says in verse 3. But because they have itching ears, verse 3, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will gather teachers because the word there for itching ears literally means to be tickled in the ear. In other words, to be stimulated, to be made to laugh, to, to be entertained. He says because they want to be entertained, they will find teachers who will tell them things that will tickle their ears. They would rather laugh and feel good, but not know the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. We will want any, we don't want any teaching, hear me now, that causes introspection. We don't want any teaching that causes us to search our heart. We don't want any teaching that says to God, examine me and try my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. We only want teachings that are positive. Positive air. It's interesting that term is becoming increasingly popular in our culture. But psychologists are saying they now coined a new category that they call toxic positivity. That's what psychologists say. Toxic positivity, they define, it means to only focus on the positive things and rejecting anything that triggers negative emotions. And they say this is a way of living they say this way of living is toxic because it teaches us to avoid negative emotions, which leads to suppression, denial, and even deeper hurt and pain. Well, the psychologists are discovering, they're saying that because of this toxic posi positivity, it says it causes us to never deal with the root of our pain. Because then if we never deal with the root of our pain, then we can never deal with we can never achieve healing. 
nothing wrong with po- positivity, but toxic positivity is one that denies the reality of our soul. It is pretending that there is no hurt there. He says, they say that this, because of this focus, it causes us to not process our hurt, our pain, and emotions so that we can get healing. And I want to suggest that the psychologists are unto something that Scripture teaches. In order for our hearts to be truly mended, we must allow Christ through his word and his spirit to deal with our brokenness. We cannot experience all that Christ has for us if we no longer see his word as all sufficient for us. I'm going to read what he says in chapter 3, verse 16, in the same uh, what Paul says. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word there is God breathed, that God breathed out the words of scriptures to the writers. He says, and notice what he says, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, the scripture of Christ, in the scripture, Christ is revealed and he shows us for our benefit what needs to be corrected in our lives. What is out of alignment with him? What needs to be changed? It is why he tells now, it is why he tells Timothy in chapter 4, verse 2, to preach the word. That is why the word of God must be central to congregational life. It is why we must change the channel. Because the word of Christ is what transforms the heart and aligns our life with his. It's the word of God. It is beneficial for life. And that's what he says in uh, chapter 4, verse 2. He says to Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. And here it literally means to preach the word when it's favorable, to proclaim the word, to teach it when people want to hear it, and also preach it when it's unfavorable, when it's unpopular when it does not want to be received in the heart. That is how essential the word of Christ is. And he goes on to say in so many ways, and do not dilute its message. He says, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. The word there for convince means to tell the fall, allow scripture to point out What's wrong? He says rebuke means admonish, show the seriousness of our predicament. But then he also says exhort, meaning to comfort the sinner, to bring the word of Christ, the love and the mercy and the grace of God to the heart of the listener that is revealed in Christ's words. And he says that this must be done with long suffering. In other words, with great patience. When the word of God is central to our life and the congregational life, then we must patiently share it. You know, it's interesting, the word there for long suffering, because what he's showing us there is that because the word is preached and the truth is revealed, we sometimes want people to just grab onto it right away. And if they don't, we think, well, there's something wrong with them. But here he's saying, because of human nature, because of who we are, just think about your own heart, how, how God has been working through some things with you and taking you on a journey. Although you know it's true that, 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 that you should not uh, practice or think this way, he is still taking you, he's still patient, he's long-suffering with us. And here he's saying that when, even when we're teaching the word of Christ in its undiluted sternness and in its truth, that we are to do it with great patience because God's timing is what, what matters. We, don't, we should not be frustrated when people do not respond in the way that we want them to or when we want them to. We want people to get it right away. Well, if it's true, then just follow it. But we must be long-suffering. We must take our time 
and allow Christ through his word to transform the atmosphere of our soul, to change the challenge, the channel of our hearts. That's how our hearts are changed. That's how our perspective is reshaped. It is by focusing on the word of God because it reveals Christ to us. But the last thing I want to share that the word of God does is that it also prepares us to see Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the word of God actually stirs in us a longing to see him. If we are not excited about the return of Jesus Christ, if in our hearts the thought of him coming brings dread or fear or no eager anticipation, then we must ask ourselves the question, where are we in relationship with him? Are we allowing his word to stir in us a longing and a love for Jesus Christ. The word of Christ actually creates in us a desire to finally see him face to face. That's what the word of God does. Notice what he says in verse 8, my final passage here. He says, Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but get this now, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Here he's talking about the reward of those who live their lives every day in surrender and love and devotion to Jesus Christ. They will receive a crown of righteousness, eternity with God. But notice what he says, that he will reward those who have a love for his appearing, who want to see him, who love him so much that they cannot wait for him to come. And my brothers and sisters, it is only the word of Christ and the spirit of God that can awaken that love for us. This is why the word of God is so critical for these times. It is his word, as Christ has revealed, that allows us to be aligned with his. The word of Christ can save our lives. In World War I, a soldier by the name of Leonard Knight, only 17 years old, was shot in the chest by an enemy bullet. He fell to the ground and he was absolutely amazed that he was still alive. He reached for where he felt the bullet go across his chest and he realized that the pocket Bible that he was carrying had saved his life. Apparently, the Bible had stopped the bullet from penetrating into his heart. Incredibly, the bullet stopped just 50 pages from the end of his small pocket Bible. The Bible apparently he had received from his aunt just a few months before. And little did he know then that that Bible would save his life. And like him, my brothers and sisters, I want to suggest this today, that when we have Christ's word in our hearts, he protects us from all of the enemy's attacks, all of his darts. And when we have his word in our hearts, it actually, of the power of God, is released. His life is released, saving our lives. That's how powerful the word of God is. It has power in Christ to save our lives. So I want to invite you today to bow your heads with me and ask the Lord to awaken in us a love 
for his word to cause us to see how important, how urgent of a need it is and how it's only having his word in our hearts that prepares us to meet him. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. Lord, we thank you that in this moment that you're doing something in us that we cannot explain or even sometimes detect because your spirit often moves in us unbeknownst to us. And so, Lord, today in this moment, we're asking that you would move in our hearts today in such a marked way that we would have a hunger for you, a hunger for your word, that everything in this world, that all the other channels in our lives, that they would, that they would fall into the background, that we would turn the channel of our hearts to you, Create in us, O oh God, a longing for you. This is our prayer in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, that everyone say, Amen. Our prayer is that you were blessed by the message today. Please plan to join us this afternoon for our homeless ministry. We are looking forward to ministering together this afternoon. And don't forget, there's a lot going on here at church. Next week, we have the women's conference that's going to start here at 7 o'clock. We have youth ministries that's going on. And if you're really trying to ask these questions like, what can I do to be involved at Hillcrest? You can always give. We have the Cash App, and we also have the online giving that's already set up. And even if you can't do that, you can do the free gift of sharing this service with who? With everyone. And we cannot wait to see you all here next week at Hillcrest. generous support of the ministries here at Hillcrest SDA Church. To give, visit our website and hit the donate tab or visit Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign the Hill Nashville. 
Thank you for your support.